Okay, so I kind of abbreviated the title a little bit. Uh, the original title was meant to emphasize Spark and machine learning, but uh, I call this actually Azure Databricks 101. It's a general introduction that covers a lot of material but tries to get your heads around what is Azure Databricks and why do you care kind of stuff. My name is Brian Kapke. I'm a data and AI solutions consultant uh, independent, so if you're looking for that, let me know. Uh, also, you can get the content for this on my GitHub account at github.com slash bcafferkey slash shared. Look under a folder called Azure Databricks. All of my uh, YouTube channel content is also there. So if you look under a folder, I zip it up. You just download the zip folder and then unzip it and you get the content, usually slides and definitely any kind of code, etc. All right, so I want a little about myself before I jump in. One, connect on LinkedIn with me. I'm glad to connect. Just let me know you saw this video, you liked it or didn't or whatever, uh, but just that you want to connect. It's helpful to know who's, like why you're requesting sometimes because sometimes people just want sales. It's nice to know, you know, what's why you're interested in what you're doing. Also, I have a YouTube channel. As I mentioned, I'm a consultant. Prior to consulting last couple of months, uh, just actually two months ago, I, I left Microsoft because I wanted to get back into the real world of consulting. But I developed the data science training content on Microsoft Learn. So I was part of the worldwide learning uh, content development. Also, the in-person uh, instructor-led content around data science. So take a look at that. But uh, Microsoft Learn is a great platform to get all kinds of documentation and training on Azure. I'm also uh, was a data and AI solutions enabler, so I worked with a lot of customers, getting them up to speed and selecting the proper platform and architecture from Azure standpoint. The decades of IT experience, and I am a past data platform MVP and cloud and data center MVP. Also, I'm the author of Pro PowerShell for Database Developers, a riveting book. And uh, I'm experienced in a lot of different industries here, so kind of gotten into a lot. And I run a SQL Pass chapter, which is the Rhode Island Microsoft BI user group. As I mentioned, I do have a YouTube channel. I've kind of gone ballistic on Azure Databricks, so take a look at uh, the videos. If you're really interested in this subject, at this point, I think I have about eight videos. I just posted one about a week ago. I haven't really promoted it yet, but it's all about using the community edition for free, as well as how to, how to get some really up and running with Databricks quickly. So a quick question I'd like to start with is, who said, give me a place to stand and a level long enough and I will move the world? I like to always throw a little trivia out. And that was an ancient Greek name, Archimedes. And Archimedes was a mathematician, physicist, but it really fits, I think, this subject matter because what we're trying to do now with this massive amounts of data is move the data and make use of it. We're trying to tap into vast amounts of data to get answers to current problems we have. And I do like to start out also with a big trend I've been noticing, which is the three big technology trends we see today. Obviously, cloud is taken over as the platform. Just a couple of years ago, people would ask, I don't know if we're going to go to the cloud. And I don't see anybody saying that anymore. Now everyone's pretty much just saying, when and how do we get there? So that's a big thing. Big data and AI are the really combination, two big things that are dominant when you get to the cloud and really benefit from the cloud because the scale you need is not practical for on-premise. So here you see Azure Databricks is centered right in all of these technologies, which is a good reason to want to know about them and make your skills relevant. On the right-hand side, I'm showing a bunch of different use cases in which Databricks can be applied from just exploring data, seeing trends, finding data science and machine learning solutions. I'm particularly excited about the opportunities in healthcare with genomics. We have the opportunity to solve cancer problems and, and diseases all kinds of medication research, et cetera. There's a lot going on there that's, that's really exciting. Now, I find a lot of times when I was talking to customers from Microsoft, people feel a little overwhelmed. There's so much stuff going on and it's, it can be a little overwhelming. So I always like to tell people, you know, try to remember when you first got into programming, when you first got interested in what you do, and hopefully you kind of came to this on your own. I got into it almost by accident from a friend and I just got excited about computers and programming and I, Try to approach everything with that inner child, that kid that's excited with all these new tools, all this new stuff, and be like the kid on you know your birthday where you get all these presents. You never give a present back. It's a new toy. It's a new thing to play with. Databricks is going to be great, as you'll see, because it takes all these things you've been hearing about and it makes them easy to use. So you can get right in and start being productive, and you don't have a lot of scary things to deal with. So 
let's talk a little about where we're heading in this discussion. I'm going to talk about scale up and scale out and Barry the weightlifter. I'm going to talk about Apache Adupe and my kitchen drawer. I'm going to talk about Azure on Fire with Spark. And then Azure Databricks, the complete Spark solution on Azure. Now, this is going to be a very demo focus, so fear not. It won't be all death by slides here. But I did want to kind of cover the main points. It's important to get a level set, like when we talk about scale up versus scale out. So just to make sure nobody's kind of left out of the loop on this, scale up is something that had been around really since the beginning of computers. I can remember it used to be with a SQL server. You'd get a point where the database was getting billions of rows or millions of rows and it was getting slower. The memory couldn't handle things. And the typical solution was just add more memory, get a more powerful computer, go to SSD, go to all these different techniques. And you could always, just by adding more hardware, you could get through the problem. It was never that big a deal because you weren't getting into the kind of volume we have today. But there's a point at which that doesn't work. And Barry, the weightlifter here, trying to do everything on his own, he can't do everything at some point. And at some point, it's going to make more sense to bring in a group of people. So on the right, you can see a group of people is to solve the problem. So this would be scale out. The idea is you bring in a set of computers, any number of computers, and they share the workload. So how would that work? Well, suppose you have a phone book. And you want to find anyone who's living on Main Street. Well, you could take that, and instead of having one person try to do that, you could take the phone book, split it up by the first letter of the last name, give a section of that. That's partitioned, right? We partitioned it by the first letter of last name. And then we hand a different set of the data to a different person and say, start your search. And then when they find the answer, they hand it back to you. And you asking for this would be like the cluster manager. The individual people are like the nodes and the executors actually doing the work. And then finally, there's the person who wanted to know that answer, who the cluster manager hands the answer to. So that's really what scale out is about. The idea is you break the data into smaller sections, and it has to obviously be managed very carefully because you don't want to have duplicate sets of the data. It has to be partitioned just right. Um, and then you can have a number of people, or computers in this case, working on the problem. So now that I've covered that, let me give you another piece of background, which I want to talk about Apache Hadoop and my kitchen drawer. Now, I have a drawer in the house. I've always had one of these. Even growing up, we had these. And I found a phenomenon that many people have these in their house. It's some drawer where when you don't know where things go, you throw it in there. So it's old flashlight, old locks, maybe old cell phones, calculators, keys. And it's just kind of a junk drawer, right? And a lot of people have that. And sometimes when I look at the Apache Hadoop ecosystem or project, it reminds me of this. If I show you this, for instance, this is a subset of what's in the Apache Hadoop project, and there's a lot of different things. Now, in the center, you can see the origin of Hadoop, which is MapReduce, and then Yarn Resource Manager, the resource negotiator, that managed the overall process in Hadoop. And then you have HDFS, which is the file system under it. But then that became too limited, so machine learning was added with Mahout, and then SQL support with Hive, and then ETL, and that was the core. But then someone came along and came up with something like Kafka, and these Kafka is like a queuing service. It didn't belong to this project originally, but when they were done, they said, you know, we're going to open source it. We'll throw it over the, we'll lob it over the fence into the junk drawer there, or the project, the Apache project. And Storm is like that, and Solar, and you can think of all these things. Well, Spark was developed actually by the founders of Azure Databricks, or Databricks, I should say, they, the founders actually wrote Spark. And what Spark was really, I think, targeting, and this is some of my own view of this, but Spark addresses a lot of the limitations, I think, in what Hadoop did. Hadoop MapReduce was the original sort of scale out architecture in open source. Spark does the same thing, but it has a lot of features that you don't get in Hadoop MapReduce. Now, I want to point out that Databricks is on top of Spark. So when you talk about Databricks, you are talking about Spark. And we'll talk about what's the difference between them in a minute. But again, the founders of Databricks saw some things that they wanted to make a commercial product, and that became Databricks. And then the other stuff we see here, real-time uh, analytics, is Spark. Okay, so you got all these other projects, but that's one takeaway. So when we talk about the Hadoop ecosystem, you can see all these different possible things. And I'll make a slight side note because sometimes there's some confusion about HD Insight versus Databricks. HD Insight could implement any number or one of these particular things. So with HD Insight, you could say, I really want that MapReduce cluster. Or you might say, I want to use Kafka. 
Well, you might say I want to use, I want to create an HBase or something in HD Insight. So HD Insight is an open source based, not cloud based. It wasn't optimized for the cloud. It's basically the Hortonworks distribution, hence the HD of the Apache project, and it implements whichever part of that that you request it. So when we talk about Databricks, we're talking only about Spark. So the only way you can compare HD Insight to Databricks would be to think of creating a Spark cluster with HD Insight or Databricks. And I'm going to talk about the difference a little bit more, but mostly just between open source versus why we even have Databricks. So this kind of a diagram gives you a kind of a high level picture of what's going on in Spark. You have a driver program, that's your entry point. You say, I have to make a request. I want you know to know what's the total number of people in the city of San Francisco or something. And that would be coming through the driver. The driver then would go to the cluster manager and the cluster manager would orchestrate getting the answer to your question. And underneath the cover, it could be any data source you want going into this, this orchestration or this query. A key thing to take away is that while H Hadoop, MapReduce, reads and writes data, it, it uses HDFS, and it typically, as it's running its queries, it's constantly writing data back to storage. And that slows it down a lot. Spark does not do that. Spark tries to run almost as much as it can in memory, and as a result, it's about 100 times faster in most cases than MapReduce, which is why it's really taking over as the open source big data tool of choice in the world. And uh, just want to highlight that. So this is kind of the architecture. When you split up the work, as we talked about before, you have to push the sections of the data, the partitions to each node. But the code that's going to work on them also has to go out to the nodes, right? So each program has to be running independent on the nodes, and then it kind of has to assemble it all together and give you a result. So that's a lot of complexity going on in Spark. Now, when we look here, we can see that we have a lot of different tools or services within Spark. You have the core engine, which actually works with a data abstraction called Resilient Distributed Data Sets. But nowadays, you don't have to get too much into that. They've added some nice services around it, including Spark SQL. So number one takeaway, if you forget almost everything else, I would call out that SQL, if you're a SQL developer, you know relational databases, SQL, in my view, is the most important data engineering language on Spark. It, it leverages a tuning engine called uh, Catalyst and another piece called Tungsten, which basically creates optimized query plans, very much like a relational database. Uh, Spark has been moving along uh, the lines of adding database functionality into it as time goes on, and Spark SQL is a first-class language, part of Spark, very performant and very powerful. You also have machine learning services available through MLlib. So you can do all that kind of stuff. You can do direct streaming in Spark. So if you have like an IoT application or something and you want to stream directly to Spark, it can support that. As well as a graph API that lets you kind of do that sort of hierarchical or sort of network navigation, like somebody in LinkedIn and who they're connected to, et cetera. And it supports a bunch of different ways of managing the resources, Yarn and Mesos and its own scheduler. Now, a key other takeaway is Spark can do real-time interactive processing and that is something that you couldn't do with the old MapReduce. So a lot of nice features here. And it also has an exposed API so that you can take advantage of any of these features you see on the slide via a language which implements the API. So when you think of something like Python, you would use the package PySpark and that would allow you to access all of these features through Python. Uh, Scala has a direct API in because the entire thing's written in Scala, as does Java. And then uh, you also can do R. R has two different packages, which gets a little confusing, called Spock R or Spockly R, and you can kind of choose or mix and match those. Uh, problem with it, though, is it's hard to set up Spark. This, it's powerful once it's there, but it is not trivial to set it up. It's also not that easy to use, right? It's a lot of complexity, a lot of configuration options, a lot of things, knobs and things you got to turn. It's not optimized for the cloud. So when you're in something like Azure, if you're using like HD Insight, you notice it's significantly slower to create and do things in HD Insight, especially creating new clusters, as opposed to Databricks because Databricks was optimized for the cloud. And there's no dev tools, right? You pick and choose what you want, but there's really nothing given to you as part of Spark. It's like you got the raw service. 
So I kind of would equate it to something like, uh, oh, I'm on a different slide, sorry. So when you talk about Databricks, what is Databricks giving you? Well, it's giving you the access to all of those Spark resources, but it's giving you a user-friendly front-end portal with a lot of tools to get you up and running easily on Spark. So that's what Databricks is really meant to do. It's meant to enable you to use Spark on the cloud in a really powerful way. It gives you a development tool called Notebooks, which is a little like Jupyter Notebooks, but much more powerful and very Spark enabled. It gives you an integrated storage system called Blob Storage. And uh, so you have Blob and you actually have a file system storage. And when you create, we'll see a workspace, an Azure Databricks workspace, it automatically gives you that Blob account and integrates it in. Uh, it gets really easy to create clusters. If you use Databricks, you can forget, as I do, because at times I look back at Spark, and the work it takes if you were to do this directly in Spark, just creating a cluster. But you'll see in Databricks, it's really easy to create new clusters and manage them. You also get job scheduling, something that is not part of Spark. You can schedule jobs to run weekly, daily, which is great. You might have some sort of a machine learning training run or just some sort of ETL type job that you'd like to run every Tuesday or maybe overnight when the system's down, et cetera. So you need those kind of tools. You also get Active Directory integration and role-based access controls. So you can really lock down the environment and the tools in a nice secure way, which is critical in this day and age. You get language and performance extensions. So it isn't just Spark you're getting. You're getting, again, these people wrote Spark, so they actually have parts of it that kind of replace with Databricks, including the runtime as opposed to the default open source runtime and yeah, optimizations. So the question becomes like, okay, I want to emphasize a little bit, like why do I need Databricks? What is it going to do for me? And I want to say that this is a crude analogy, but imagine you want to stream one of your favorite TV shows and you get something like this, a, a punch down blocks, you know, wires, all this stuff, and you're going to have to figure out the right way to configure the wire, get the right signal, so you can just stream a TV show or something, right? Uh, Databricks is more like on the right. Everything's given to you. It's got a nice GUI. Everything's accessible. You can jump right in on the right and pop around and do things, but you can't do that so easily on the left, and that's that's a huge takeaway. Let me just get here. All right. So kind of to summarize, like, what are we really getting with Azure Databricks over just Spark? We're getting cluster management, easy cluster creation, we're getting folders, a whole sort of storage management system and folders. We get the development tool of notebooks. We get libraries. So one of the things that is not a trivial thing to do on, on a Spark cluster is you want to use some sort of open source library. So maybe it's a, a Python library or one that I use with R sometimes. It's called the Psych package. And in order to do that, I need to actually apply that package to every node in the cluster. Well, that's not a trivial thing to do in something like HD Insight even, but you can do it really easily with Databricks. It can automatically take it care of that when you create the cluster. You get jobs and you get the security we talked about. Okay, so now I've got to try to remember to talk about all these things we're going to get into as I go through a demo here. So I'm going to go into, I started my demo here. Let's see if that should go. Hopefully my cluster will be back. So I'm going to go back here for a minute. And I'm in my Azure portal. So you need to get into the Azure portal. You want to say create a resource. So you can go over here in the left and create a resource. And this is a typical thing whenever you're using Azure. You need to define what you want to use in Azure. And what it will do is it creates certain resources and then links that to your account so that you get billed for it basically and it can track what you're doing. So it all kind of comes back to creating some service or space that will then attach to your account. So here I'm interested in using Databricks. So I can start typing. There it is. I can say create. And you pick your subscription. Now in the resource group, if you're not familiar with what a resource group is, it's like a box in which you're going to place resources you're creating in Azure. The thing I would recommend when you're doing this, if at all possible, is to create a separate resource group, a brand new one, specific to your Azure Databricks workspace. So we're going to be creating an Azure Databricks workspace. And so you'd want to say create new here, for instance, and I might say ADBWS. Okay. And when I create this, that's a whole new workspace. Now, the reason I recommend customers do that is that 
if you decide you don't want to use Databricks anymore and you're done playing around or whatever you're doing, you want to get rid of it, you can just delete the resource group. When you create a workspace or many things, for instance, even a virtual machine or Azure SQL DB and things, there's a lot of different things created under the covers for you that Azure takes care of. But when you're done using them, you might decide you don't want them anymore. Well, you don't necessarily know what it created. There's actually in the Databricks workspaces, I think I counted like 14 or 15 different visible things, let alone the hidden things that'll be there. So if I try to just delete pieces of it, I'll probably miss something and still be paying for it. And it could be kind of like an orphaned resource. So if you create it in its own resource group, it makes it a lot easier to just get rid of it later. You can just delete the entire resource group and you won't be paying anything. All right, uh, I should mention also creating this workspace in Azure itself will create the basic resources that you need, but it doesn't really cost much until you start creating clusters, which we're not doing here. Now I use the convention of RG, under, RG resource group underscore AD, BWS, so I would then call this ADBWS. And then you pick a location. Now, the only thing about location is wherever you are, try to pick the region in Azure closest to you. So I'm in the Boston area in uh, Mass. I'm sure you can't tell from my accent, but um, so you'd pick that, you know, something close to you. And pricing tier, I hate to think they charge more for it, but you do need, you're probably going to want the role based access controls that gives you more granular control over your security and things. So it's worth getting premium. Uh, and then you just say review and create and you're good to go and you can look at other things in here. There are some other options, for instance, uh, recently added was the ability to create your machines in your in your own VNet, which is nice and things like that. But I'm going to cancel out of this. I'm not going to actually create this. I already have one uh, workspace for this, but I just wanted to show this once you have the workspace created. As I do here, uh, I can go into it here so I can go into AW ADBS. I can say launch the workspace. And you notice it doesn't even prompt me for security. It's using my Azure AD credentials. It knows who I am. It knows that I've got this workspace. Now, this is coincidentally, it looks a little bit like the Azure portal workspace, but this is Databricks own UI. If you were to use, if you go to the community edition of Databricks, you'll see the exact same sort of look. It just won't say Microsoft Azure. And Databricks can also run on AWS, uh, but it doesn't have the integration features. Microsoft worked for a long time with Databricks to get this fully integrated. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is take a look at our clusters. I've got one cluster running, which is great, and I minimize how many nodes I take, et cetera, to make things uh, cheap because I'm I don't I'm paying for this. But you can now say, you know, my cluster, give it a name. A cluster is that set of machines you want to use to distribute the work. You have two modes you can do high concurrency or you can do standard okay you're generally going to go with standard high concurrency is if you have a cluster and you want to share it with a bunch of people and you want it to be uh preemptive sharing in the sense that if i was hogging it it will actually put my work aside for a minute and let somebody do some work and then go back so it manages the cluster that is a value added databricks gives you that you don't get in standard databricks pooling is a new thing where if you have Microsoft actually has machines that could be standing by ready to be used. If you want to use that, then you can you can do that and it will actually speed up the acquisitions of your cluster. Basically it makes it a little bit faster to create a cluster. Um, I haven't really taken advantage of that too much. Not sure how much it gives you. Uh, then you have your runtime version. So this is really the, the driver that's going to be running Databricks. It is not open source Spark as you notice, but it is under the covers using Spark. Uh, so you can see here, I always go with the default some of these other ones are beta and other ones are more specific to machine learning workloads, et cetera. So I'm just going to take the default. This is one of my favorite features. This and this, these two things here, enable auto scaling means that now I can pick any number of worker nodes. Think of additional machines under the covers is the easiest way to think of worker nodes. How many machines or how many nodes will I need people running, you know, to, as I showed you earlier? Well, I can go by default two to eight. Now be careful because your subscription, your account may not allow you, and I had this happen to me the other day, may not allow me to create as many as I want. So I do have to watch that. Make sure if you're going to do this at work, you know what it allows you. Uh, but here you can say, say two to, we'll say four. And the enable auto scaling says, it's not going to actually give me any more nodes than I need. So if I went in there with like 100K of a file, it's going to probably give me one node. It'll actually auto scale down and get, you get one node. You don't need any more. Um, but if I then came up with a petabyte, 
it might say, I can't even do this with four. Say I give it a thousand. It says, okay, I'm going to give you the maximum of workers. I need it because of what you're doing. So auto scaling allows you to automatically let Databricks figure out what it needs. Again, a feature you don't get in HD Insight, for instance. Another thing you can do here, I always set this down to about 30. You can terminate your cluster after some moments of inactivity. Really important to manage this because why pay for a cluster that you don't need? In Databricks, the storage of data and everything is trivial in price compared to the compute. Pretty much true across the board in Azure. So you don't want to run this if you're not using it. 30 minutes, if I'm over here having lunch or something even, I'd rather terminate the cluster. It only takes a few minutes to start it up again, and I'm going to save myself money. So set that as low as you want. I would probably say even 15 minutes. I wouldn't go for two hours to default as a rule. Um, and then you have the worker nodes. And you notice here you can customize this a lot, give it a lot more memory. If you're doing something, I don't have the access on this, but you can use GPUs. You can do a lot of stuff to really optimize your compute. And of course, you're going to pay correspondingly. But if you're doing something, you really need that, you get that. And then you have these advanced options. You can configure your spot cluster. Uh, you can add tags. You can do log. Tags allow us to give things like what cost center is this and track attributes. We can turn logging on and off, etc. So that's all it really a cluster is. Then once you create it, it takes about five minutes for it to start the cluster. So that's that's a cluster. A cluster is absolutely critical. You cannot do any work without a cluster. It's the nature of the game. You can see here like what it's giving me here. Uh, I'm going to cancel out. I'm not going to actually create a cluster, but I did want to show you that piece. This is a huge value add. If this alone makes Databricks worth using because it's not that trivial or easy. Uh, in HD Insight, you would have to delete a cluster if you didn't want to pay for it. But as you see here, it can be terminated. Now, when you go along here, you can also click on it and see the properties of a cluster. Uh, but if you go along here, one thing also, as you hover in certain places in Databricks, it's not obvious, but you'll get these menus and options that click up these links. So I can go to the Spark UI, for instance, here, and that'll show me what's, and I can drill down into Spark. I haven't really done anything yet. I can I can start or stop the cluster, et cetera. So a lot of stuff I can do in there. So now that we got that, the next thing we're going to need probably is some data. Now, I actually have created a lot of data on this playing around, but I'm going to show you the easiest way, I think, to create data. And um, I'm going to do that by going into data. So easy. Uh, click on add data. Now, you could bring in JSON files or any kind of files. I like to play with, especially if you're just exploring CSV files. And good old AdventureWorks provides a nice baseline for some of this. So let's say I want to bring in something like, we'll say, AW product. I just find this, and this is available in the GitHub account to play with these files. Uh, AW product, for instance, this is the product dimension of data and AdventureWorks. And it comes up here. Now notice it's going to use in the Databricks file storage system, it's going to actually upload the data to file store slash table. So that's like a subdirectory folder. And it's putting it in there so that I can then use it. Now, once it's there, and notice it says it uploaded it there. Now, I could use code to load it, but I'm going to get lazy and use the UI. And I have to, I always have to have a cluster. So it says, okay, I'm going to go to that cluster. Preview the table. And it's kind of weird because it scrolls down. So you can scroll down this page. And I already created one here. It should give me an error, but I'll just do one, two, three to make it a little bit easier. Uh, so this table exists. Be aware that it always takes that file extension and makes it part of the table name, which I don't like. What I'm doing is creating a SQL table from a flat file. So I uploaded it, and I could query it that way if I wanted to, but I'm going to turn this into a SQL table, which makes it really easy to leverage that information quickly. Uh, I can create any number of databases. I have a couple in here, like AW1, et cetera, MyDB. I'm going to use the default, and I'm going to say that the first row, notice it doesn't have column headings. It doesn't know this yet. First row is header. So it's going to use the first row for my column names. And if I say in first schema, that will actually create SQL data types that match the data itself because it's going to scan the data. Be a little bit careful if you have a lot of data because it will actually look through the data. But this is nice for when you're, you're learning how to use it. Then all I have to do is say create table. And what's going to happen now is Databricks is going to go out and create my table based on this file I uploaded. And you can see it now has a description of it and there's some sample data. And now we can start using it. So I'm going to just swipe this so that because I'm lazy and don't like to type. And if I go in here, uh, I'm in the workspace over here. So notice I clicked on workspace. The workspace is where we keep our notebooks. It's the sort of file structure that we can use to organize our folders, et cetera. For instance, by default, 
there's a users folder and each account has its own folder within that. Um, I'm going to go in here and just create create something. Now I can create a notebook. I can create a library, which is importing like a open source library. I can create a new folder uh, and MLflow, which is, is really Microsoft's. It's an integration with Microsoft's machine learning. Uh, I can import things and export. We'll look at that too. But I'm going to create a new notebook. Now, one thing when I create a notebook, I have to give it a name. So I'll give this one uh, virtual demo, we'll say. And I have to tell the language. So the language only matters in that it will use this language as the default language if I don't tell the notebook otherwise. Notebooks can contain any of the languages supported by, by Spark, with the exception of Java, which it can use only through JAR files. Um, all right, and then the clusters there. So I'm going to use SQL as my default. Go in here quickly. And what does that mean? It means I can do something like this from, and I'm going to limit this because uh, I don't want to have too many rows. And now I can directly query. This is the data we just uploaded. And I can easily now start querying it and do all kinds of cool stuff. Now, before I get into demoing a little bit more about this stuff in the notebook, I, I think one thing that's really cool is we're sitting here on this data side, but I can also go over here and do a grid. Now, that's not a very useful grid, but I can go to plot options. And obviously, data manufacturer is not really good. Uh, maybe weight. Uh, maybe that isn't too good. Uh, let's see. Price would be nice. Dealer price. Let's see if that came up correctly. And that's not doing too good. Let me do a count. So I'll just count. That way I get a number. And that's pretty cool. Um, I do series groupings. And let me change this to a, we'll say a pie chart. I guess that's not too good. Not getting a very useful chart here. No, all right. But I can go in here and do a query. I'll show you some better ones later. I'm trying to do this on the fly. Apparently my dealer price isn't very useful. Uh, but I can do a lot of stuff in there. And then I can just run a query and say apply and it will generate the graphic. Now I'll go into a different one in a minute because that wasn't a good one. But I just wanted to really emphasize here that we're doing a, a query and what's going on. So let me go to my demo notebook I have which would be a little bit better. So one of the things I want to show you is, number one, you must have a cluster to do a notebook, to work with a notebook, okay? That's here. If you don't have one, it will question, it'll ask you to sign one. It'll prompt you. From the file menu, I can clone, meaning create a copy. I can rename. I can move this notebook to a different folder. I can delete it. I can export it. Now I can export it to a few different formats. DBC is the Databricks, Databricks compressed, and that's probably the best way to export it. You can export entire folders of notebooks in that format the same way. So you can give someone, you know, any number of notebooks. And what's nice is when they import it, it's one file, but it will expand into the other notebooks. But you can also turn it into an IPython, or which is just a Jupyter notebook, a source file, etc. cetera. Uh, and you have all this stuff. You can clear revision history. You can view results only, which is either going to be notes and an output. Or I can say code in view. I can set permissions up here. So up here I'm doing things like if I had other people in here, I could say if they can run, edit, manage, or just read a notebook. So again, permissions are kind of sprinkled everywhere in Databricks, and you can really lock things down as much as you want to. Notice there's an admins group, so you can give people the admin authority. Uh, I can go over here and just get some help on keyboard commands, which is better way. It's really a better way to navigate things. Uh, I can do comments things in there as well and I'm yeah and I can even do the revision button I can't reach it too good because this uh, webinar thing is blocking that side of my screen a little bit but you can also do check revision history and your notebooks can be integrated with github so really cool now a couple other things notebooks consist of a series of input boxes called cells so if you go down here you can see things like this and some cells are documentation only they actually have a little percent MD at the top, meaning markdown, which is a way of creating documents, cells, or coding, uh, excuse me, documentation. And then you have like SQL would be in it magic that means it's a SQL cell. So cell, the way a cell is uh, marked as a certain type is using this magic at the top, which we'll see. If it's Python, it would be percent Python. But notice this notebook is in Python. So I don't have to use a cell magic. It will assume Python unless I tell it otherwise. Uh, so if I double click here, 
you can see there's a magic MD. And then these pounds basically equate to like an H tag in HTML. So four is like an H4, this is an H2. And I can just get out of that. And I can also even do things that's not a very useful diagram, but I wanted to demonstrate that you can even have images in here. Now, a really important thing with notebooks is I sometimes hear people, developers and people say, I don't like notebooks. And I think that's kind of like saying, I don't like hammers. Well, you want to use a hammer when it's the best tool for the job. You got a nail, a hammer is a good tool to have. Notebooks are designed to explore. They're designed to be um, analytic and things. They're not designed to write a web app. So a lot of times people say that, they're thinking sort of in a, in a web app, you know where you're going, you know where you're coming from. You say, I'm going from Chicago to Boston, here's my route, done, I don't need anything else. But this is more like the Lewis and Clark expedition. You're going in, you don't know what you're gonna find, you wanna be able to find your way back, you wanna leave some breadcrumbs along the way, that's what notebooks are about. And that's why they're really well suited for analytics and data science. So again, this is just showing I can do percent SQL is the magic because this is a Python notebook and I can go against this AW product table. And you notice it's kicking in over here. It's actually running Spark. So it's saying it's gonna run the, it's getting what they call an execution context. It's reaching out to Spark and now it's gonna run the code. Okay, hopefully that will run quicker. Kick that off for a minute. Okay, that's hopefully I'll stop running soon so I can get through some of the other stuff. Uh, I can also use SQL has some extensions, so I can say something. Thank goodness it came back. <laughs> so anyway, you can see that, um, and I have this whole widgets thing I can do. I can do all kinds of types of bars. I could do a, for instance, like pie chart different things I can play with in there, but we'll get into something a little more interesting. So I'm not gonna to say too much, but we have something called widgets, which I'll talk a little bit about later on. Uh, but I wanna also have this table. Suppose I wanna see a description, what's in the table, I can use the describe command. And that's kind of nice. It kind of reminds me of like when I'm in SQL Server and I wanna be able to see a quick list of what's in a table. Now I can also do something here. I'm gonna create, I wanna allow a visual interactive widget that allows me to customize my search, my filters. So I'm gonna create a drop-down list of fiscal year. And notice how I can do this using only SQL and a query. So I'm gonna have my selection be the distinct fiscal year values. If I run this, it takes a minute. And then it's gonna, it should create a widget at the top that I can use later on to filter things. Okay, so there's my filter. I'll create this one, which is trying to get a list of just like categories. I wanna be able to get different category product categories, et cetera. And I'm not gonna to get too caught up in a lot of these things, but one of the things I wanna demonstrate with SQL that's really powerful is I can do all the things that I would want to do with typical SQL, okay? So this is a really nice feature because I can, for instance, here I'm creating a view. I can run this and it's creating a view called V product info. And now for the rest of the notebook, I can query and use that view just like a table. Now, if I wanted to, I could also make it a physical table by changing the word view to a table. Um, and here you can see that I can actually see it. So it's a really powerful thing. And here I'm gonna really do something here. I'm gonna take that view of dim customer and I'm gonna create a view. And I'm gonna take this date column because I wanna turn the birth date into an age so I can use it. And then here, and I know this is a lot more complex SQL than you need to see. Don't worry about understanding it all, but the important thing is I can even do things like case statements and do some pretty advanced SQL stuff. I'm creating another view, the sales info as. This one I'm taking, I wanna create age bands so that I can use them. And um, I do something, for instance, like this now. I can use some of the data from that view and I got a nice pie chart and I could change this by age bands and notice just using the function get argument category, went up here and got the category bikes. And so it's filtering on just bikes. And I can go in here with plot options and say, you know, I don't really want a pie chart, I'd rather have a bar chart. And I can play around with all different ways of doing this, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, when I'm done, I can just say apply, okay. Now, another thing you might wanna do is, in this case, remember we're in Python, so I don't have a magic on this cell. I'm gonna create a new data frame, Spark data frame, SDF, and I'm gonna use SQL, so I can pass SQL directly to it, 
and use that view. And now I'm going to get a data frame in Python, which is based on the SQL view I created. Now, what's cool, too, is a Databricks added feature, which is awesome, is called display. And display gives me all the visual capabilities using that against a Python data frame. So without even using any Python visuals, I get the benefit of it. And I can go in here and play with things, maybe move this around and change things and say apply. Now, the key thing I want to also point out, and it's hard sometimes to see it in certain places, so I'll show you it again, but one of the really nice things this display is doing is not only does it give me all this visual output, but notice that when I create a visual, it's rerunning my query as modified to what it needs to satisfy the visual. So in this case, I'm asking it to sum up sales amount and group it this way. So all it's really asking from Spark is to get things grouped by age and has children and sum up the sales amount. And that's all that's coming back to the driver node. Now, anything displayed in the visual has to come back to the driver node, which can get overwhelmed by too much data. So Databricks is doing a lot of work for me, and I can play around and do all kinds of cool stuff, and I don't even have to write the queries to do it. So that's a pretty cool feature of the visuals in Databricks. Now, in this case, I want to get it, and I'm going to use the collect method. And that's going to turn what is a Spark data frame into a local pandas data frame, which means it can only work on one node, which is the driver node. And the reason I wanted to just do that is because now I can use open source Python libraries with it, like Seaborn, although in this case I'm faking it out because I'm actually using the Iris data set. But the main thing I just wanted to show you is like you can do Python visuals here. I can use Spark R. And again, notice I'm going against the same view. The SQL becomes the touch point by which all the languages can share. Everything can access SQL tables because SQL is a core language in Spark. Okay, so you got all this cool stuff. I can download data, all this cool stuff here. Here I'm using a, a library added on to. Oh, I don't have the site package loaded. I'd have to add that, but uh, I'll show you that in a minute. Okay, uh, so you get a lot of stuff here. I can use the display with this, and it's, again, it's kind of using a more advanced Python, using a panda-like uh layering of features so you get a lot of cool stuff here and i just wanted to kind of touch on some of that you can see a lot of different cool features here all right can i move this yes all right uh one thing i also wanted to show you is on the cells you have this drop down you can copy cells cut cells so if you used jupiter in the past that's usually all done at the top but in databricks notebooks this is where you add move cells etc you even have something called show title which lets us you know, do a descriptive title here. Uh, if I want, I can also run cells or run everything above and below. So that's what that does. This allows me to sort of compress and expand a cell. This would delete the cell. So you do a lot of the management right here. Uh, cool thing. And let's see, I can also do something. I didn't run all the visuals, but I can also go to view. And uh, let me show you something here as well. This is a dashboard so I can create dashboards and pin visuals to my dashboard if I want to go view the dashboard I can just go in here for instance and say like this one and you can see I've got a dashboard here which I could use to create visuals say that are used by management now I did a whole YouTube video suggesting you could use Databricks dashboards like this instead of something like Power BI you wouldn't necessarily do it for all cases but if you had a data science team you already have Databricks there you could use this you don't even need a cluster running to be able to view a dashboard unless you want to rerun the dashboard like here if I said I want to change clothing or something then it would have to rerun the queries but if you want someone to just be able to look at visuals you could refresh this every couple of hours it only needs the cluster when it needs to refresh or maybe once a day so you can get some really good benefits cheaply uh, and you kind of get like a, a simplified Power BI without all the administration and complexity and cost of running Power BI so just a side note there so we've looked at workspaces, we've seen notebooks. Notebooks are really cool. We'll go back to the code side of things. We can see that. Um, I'm gonna go back to my slide and cheat a little bit, see if we've covered everything. We talked about dashboards, importing. So I can import if I want. I can go here and say, I wanna import a notebook. Uh, I would just go here, import, and I can browse on my local folder. And if it was like a DBC file or something, I can import it that way. And I can also export. All right. Uh, let me check again. We saw a lot of the security. Now we can also create, uh, one of the things we can also do is if I really like this notebook, um, 
I get this. I'm having trouble moving my stuff, but okay. I can click on schedule and create a job for this notebook. So a notebook is nothing more than a program and you can schedule that to run weekly, nightly, whatever you want as a schedule. So it's pretty cool here. You could say every week. Now that's one way you could schedule a notebook, um, but you can also just go to jobs and say, I want to create a new job. And then you have, you know, you give it a name and all the different attributes. A really nice feature of the jobs is by default, it will create a cluster for the job and then delete the cluster, or terminate the cluster when it's done. So you don't have to keep a cluster running to support a job that needs to run, say, every week or every day. It will do it for you, minimizing the cost. You don't have to have compute except when you're actually running the job. So it's really a nice feature. Um, and again, these are things that um, I have not had. I really would love to do a study, but I believe Databricks would cost a lot less to run in general than Hadoop or even HD Insight as a rule. The takeaway when it wouldn't necessarily be the case is when you just need to run a utility and you want to run it 24 hours by seven, maybe then, you know, another utility would work better. But when you're doing this kind of work, it makes sense. So once you have a job created, then it just runs on a regular basis. Um, so that's about that. Um, all right, what else do we have? Talk about cell action, schedule, revision history. Uh, libraries, my, okay, my last thing I need to show you. So if you have a special library you wanna bring in, you like some Python library, but it's not available directly. Now, a lot of them are. Generally, it seems Anaconda is available on Databricks without anything else. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I can go into Workspace and say create a library. And you'll notice here I can do it as a jar, Python. So I can go in here and uh, I, I, it's like say it's an R library. I'm more popular with that. I could say psych is one of the packages I use. I could say create. And up here, it shows that it's not installed, but I can say install, and it will now install it to the cluster, so I can say install. And that's going to install that package to the, no, the cluster. Bear in mind, when you install a package to a cluster, it's not just going to one machine. It could be going to 100, 1,000 machines, or whatever. It also, when you restart the cluster, will remember that you installed those packages to the cluster which is a good and bad thing. It's great for simplicity and maintenance, but it also means, and I learned this the hard way when I was trying to do some training, it will do that. And you might have, if you have a lot of different things being installed, you have to wait for those installs to complete before you can use the cluster. So you might want to have different flavors of your clusters that use certain libraries and then maybe one like real simple cluster when you just want to get in and work quickly. Uh, but you can create them easily enough. All right, so I've talked a lot about that. Um, I do see a question here. I don't think, I only see one. Related data stored, the really good question. I'm glad you brought that up because when you think Hadoop and people talk about data lakes, they always, they really think about storing data. Spark is not by default designed around storing data. It's around sucking it in. I think of like a big vacuum cleaner, sucking in all the data and stuffing it into memory. It's designed to work in memory almost as, as exclusively as it can. So it doesn't care. Your data could be in Azure SQL DB. It could be in uh, HD Insight. It could be in uh, Cosmos DB or Teradata. And it will bring it in and do the analysis and queries you want when it needs to. And that's it. So you don't really have to think in terms about storage. Now, having said that, um, I have another slide in here, but I'll, I'll mention this a little ahead. You may have heard something called uh, Data Lake, let's see, Delta Lake. Delta Lake is when what they've done is, again, the people from Databricks who wrote Spark, they decided they open sourced this, which was good because for a while it looked like it was going to be proprietary. But Delta Lake is adding SQL Server-like or relational database-like functionality to Spark. What do I mean by that? It means it's adding logging, transaction logging and support and rollbacks and commits and things like that so that you can really get snapshots of your data. So what's happening is that you're getting some functionality. but and if you want to, you can persist data. What I've done with these SQL tables is just stored a description of my CSV file 
and then I use that to do queries. When I do my queries, Spark is going to suck all that into memory and peg it and run all its queries and all that great stuff. But I don't. It's not actually restoring the data. Now I could take it and say I want to store that again in a format called Parquet, which is native. I believe that's native to Spark, and then that would be something that I could pull in, and it would already store it partitioned, so it would load it very quickly, and I could treat it much like you would a relational database tables, etc. Um, so when we get into the data, et cetera, it could be anywhere. Um, when you think of a data lake, that's basically just probably Azure Data Lake Gen 2 storage, but really it's just a place to stuff your data. Underneath the covers, it typically will partition it like HDFS or something. And there's a lot of performance things you can do to make it perform better, uh, but that's it. But now that that library, for instance, was installed, I can use the site package on that particular uh, machine. Okay, so that's something I was just alluding to, and it just, here's my slide. When I started in this, actually go back 10 years, and all you saw was relational databases, and the big data was just starting to emerge as an issue. When it did emerge, you probably have heard of something called Parallel Data Warehouse, which was Microsoft's on-premise appliance to handle big data. What it really is, and Azure Data Warehouse is just that, but in Azure, what, what that really is is just SQL Server running on many different machines and coordinating its work. In other words, scale out for SQL Server. Teradata is scale out for a relational database platform, which is proprietary to Teradata. And AWS Redshift is essentially they took Postgres, they scaled it out, and they called it Redshift. That's their version of, of their scale out version of a data warehouse. Now, the big takeaway on the left side of these things is these must the data must be loaded into this warehouse into this parallel structure it must be done because it's really a relational database under the covers so it has to be preloaded it, which also means it's not really going to be very good to handle unstructured data like images and video and sound so that's a limitation but it is really good at handling that structured data now what's happening on the right side originally MapReduce for instance did not try to do very much at all with that relational stuff but Spark is adding as I mentioned, Delta Lake, now they're talking about Delta Lake House and a lot of features that are making Spark become a lot more functional as a relational engine. It's, its optimizer is designed around SQL. So what you're seeing now in Spark, for instance, is SQL support, transaction support, logging, query tuning, and even optimized storage formats that you can persist data in. So what is happening is Spark is becoming a dessert top and a flow X, if you remember Saturday Night Live way back. It's becoming both a open source unstructured data format, but also it can become very much like a data warehouse, a traditional SQL server, and you can kind of mix and match. Now, I think that's a great thing that it's doing that because I don't think this will continue in a myriad of tools. I think... The world is looking for simple one sort of stop answers that will do everything. Spark is quickly becoming that one stop answer. So looking at these two things, I think Spark has the right thing. So if you see something like uh, Azure Synapse, Azure Synapse does use Databricks, but it's, uh, it's also heavily residing on Azure Data Warehouse, I believe. And I think that Databricks is ultimately going to be able to solve all of these things without having to really bring in a lot of external things other than libraries and things like you typically do. And uh, as a separate sort of takeaway I wanted to mention, uh, Python is also emerging as the language on Spark. So if you know Python or you don't, you should learn it. Um, I love R, but Python is really becoming sort of the de facto language and it's really powerful on Spark and Databricks. This slide just shows you how to get my content and unzip it. This slide I just want to mention, and you can get this if you go to GitHub and get the slides, but you can go on and get a free trial account on Azure and stop playing around with Databricks, or you can use the community edition of Databricks. Just go to this link here, try Databricks, and you'll find that. And also, a lot, a lot of resources. Azure Databricks documentation is at docs.databricks.com. Microsoft Learn I've mentioned. Riveting YouTube videos. Apache Spark documentation, a lot of stuff out there. Um, one of the takeaway that did not appear to me at first, you do not always need Databricks specific documentation. Be aware that there is Azure Databricks and regular Databricks, separate sets of documentation, but you don't always need that. For instance, if you wanna know how to do Python on Spark 
or Databricks, which is the same thing, you can just use the PySpark documentation. If you want to use R on, on Spark or Databricks, you can use that documentation, which is much more extensive. So I recommend go to that. It, it may, most cases, you'll find what you need. There are slight differences that Databricks does for you, but they're so slight that it won't matter. So we've talked about scale up and scale out and Barry the Weightlifter. We've talked about Apache Dupe and my kitchen drawer. We talked about Azure on Fire with Spark and Azure Databricks, the complete Spark solution. A lot of stuff. We've cut a lot of, a lot of ground. And uh, I kind of, if I could mind meld with everybody and make you remember everything I've talked about, I know I've covered a lot of material. I hope I've excited you about what the possibilities are. Databricks can go very deep and very wide. You can spend a day doing this. I have a workshop, by the way, coming up. I forgot. SQL Saturday in Albany in July, I'm doing a one-day workshop on Databricks in which I get to dig in a little more with these things and do actual hands-on labs. So if you're interested in that and you can get to Albany, look it up and or ping me and I can give you the link or just Google it. But you can go there and, and get – that'll be a full-day workshop. So I love Star Trek as well, so you can see this kind of mind-melding going on. But you see all these tools here. If you take away another takeaway, you should be aware of cluster management big, the libraries, the security, the notebooks, those are all really the big features. Uh, okay. If people have questions, you can put them in there. I don't I don't see any questions at this point. Um, okay, I see something a little bit late. People are talking about if they can't see screens. Uh, you can either use the chat window or the question. I don't see any questions being entered, so I'll leave it at that. Last slide. Oh, sorry, Brian. Yeah. I was I was talking, but I was muted, so you didn't hear me. Uh, there are actually a couple of questions. Sure. Um, and we got time for just just a couple of these, so okay. it works out kind of perfect. Yeah. Um, uh, where are the tables and date and related data stored? That's a good question. So the data is stored as CSV files on Blob, which is masked over, and they call it the Databricks file system. And basically, it just acts like DBFS is like a drive. And you can just reference it. And I, I think I showed it in. Uh, let me go here for a minute. When you go to uh, the data here, it puts it. The easiest way to do it is this. It's actually going to put it in a file store here, file store tables. But then when you create the, the um, meta store on top, really, it's just a description of how to read the file. So what it, what it should it call the names? What are the data types? We walk through that. That's what it will do there. Now, you can do more complex things, which would persist the data, again, in a different format to do that. But what we did, we just it stored it in blob storage, which is created as part of your Azure Databricks workspace. And I'll, I'll put one, and then, sorry, one, I should have added to that. Now, when, in many cases, you'll have separate Azure blob storage, which you can certainly get data from and connect to. You can mount it as a drive. You can also have things in other places like Azure DB and stuff and read it that way. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, no problem. And then another question is, is, does this easily integrate with Git? It does. I have to find where the, the link is for that. But, yeah, there's a setting you can go in and link it to uh, GitHub, at least. It, it has a GitHub integration. Um, I think GitHub would make more sense because it's not designed for on-premise. It's cloud-based. But, yeah, you can do that. Okay. And how does authorization work? How can someone limit access to data stores only to the one intended person? It, um, that's a good question. When you mount storage, I learned something in Databricks just a few weeks ago. Really hard to do that. It's kind of wide open. In general, probably your best bet is create a separate you know, blob storage account and manage the security in Azure there and then expose it to this. And you're probably not going to mount it, per se, if you're going to do that. You'd have to... Uh, restricted other ways. Um, within the tables, there's limited ability to really uh, restrict things. I don't know if there's anything here. There's really not a lot you can do there. So you want to manage it from the the sort of the source side in most cases. All right. Well, those are all the questions that we did have. And thanks again for presenting today. And thanks, everyone, for attending. Uh, this has been great. Great. All right. Thank you. So, everyone have a great day. All right, take Goodbye. care, you too.